Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Ian here, and I'm sitting in Chicago, Illinois at Exponential with Joshua Resnick. He is the CEO of Parallel Flight Technologies, a company you probably have not heard of yet, but is super, 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 super cool. So Joshua, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan. I love Commercial Drones FM, listen to all the episodes. So it's great to uh, actually get to be on the show. I did not pay him to say that at all. Wink, wink. No. Yeah, you can pay me later. <laughs> but um, thanks for listening to the podcast. That's always awesome to have a guest on the show that's uh, a listener as well. We met kind of over LinkedIn. You had reached out to me just telling me basically, I'm making a drone company and we're going to do something really freaking cool. But before, actually, we'll leave the teaser, before we talk about what drone company you created, first tell us a little bit about your background because it is incredibly interesting. So have you ever seen Alaska's Deadliest Catch? Oh, the Deadliest Catch, the one that was on Discover forever with the people doing the crabs and stuff on right? the boats. And they yeah. like, have problems and sometimes they have big problems on the boats. Yeah. So that's really where I started working on powertrain systems, which is going to tie into what we talk about. But I was living in Alaska and I had a service company for installing power systems on big fishing boats. So we're talking anywhere between 50 kilowatts and 500 kilowatts of power. What is that like roughly? Like how do I, as a layman, like what does that mean to me? That could power like a huge net going out and reeling it in or? Exactly. And all the pumps, everything that's pumping into the fish hold and the refrigeration systems on, on the boat. There's a ton of things that use power, hydraulic systems. That's what it's used for. And so I was installing those systems, working on these fishing boats, literally the boats that are on the deadliest catch, getting to know the fishermen. And I saw a huge opportunity for hybrid power systems to increase efficiency. So I started working with the state of Alaska, and I was funded by the state to do research and development for hybrid systems. And we developed a whole unique powertrain system for fishing boats up there. And then I was recruited by Tesla, and I ended up building and designing the electric system for the Tesla semi truck. So I was at Tesla for almost four years doing that. And then something happened which caused me to want to get into drones. <laughs> and now you have a drone company, and it's called Parallel Flight Technologies in its early stages. But I think what we just figured out, it was about a year and a half ago, maybe, that we first kind of got introduced to each other. Right. Um, and Basically, what I'm looking at is a flyer showing the Parallel Flight Technologies drone, the Dawn Treader 1. This is an ultra-heavy lift platform. It's an ultra-heavy lift drone. The huge mind-blowing stat on this is that with a 10-pound payload, it can hover 6.4 hours or it can fly in some type of configuration for 6.4 hours. That's absolutely ridiculous. How is this possible? What's going on here? So a little bit of background on why we're doing this. We had a forest fire about five miles from our house up in the mountains of Santa Cruz. And it was a remarkable situation. Had been in the area for about three and a half years. First time we had a big fire and the sky is glowing red at night. Ash is falling. You know, smoke is causing everybody to cough. I'm getting my family, my kids ready to evacuate. And the next day I see this... Um, Sky Crane helicopter fly overhead. We're talking about an aircraft designed almost 60 years ago. And I'm looking at it thinking, wow, that's a pretty old technology. I wonder, where is this industry at? And so I started having conversations with people in the industry, especially with Department of Interior. And I found out that there's a huge push for unmanned systems to start augmenting the manned systems. And looking at the mission profiles that were going to be needed. One of them was heavy lift for firefighter resupply and eventually even for fire suppression applications. So then based on that mission, we said, what could we build that would start to do that? And we started looking at the technology that was out there. And really when you start to try to lift anything comparable to the weight of the aircraft in payload, so if you have an electric drone and you try to lift its own weight in payload, you end up only being able to fly for about 15 or 20 minutes. So if I have a 10-pound drone and I try to lift 10 pounds, then it's just like, 
with the current propulsion and power system, it's not going to inspire anybody for long missions. Right, exactly. And it's great for a lot of missions, but it's not good for these logistics missions. For heavy lifting. Right. More than like a tiny little camera that's already probably integrated into it. Yeah, it's great for sensors, but it's not good when you're trying to move material around. Like you can't mm. shrink water, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, That's right, yeah, delivering water to a fire and yeah, interesting. Okay. So so we ended up essentially reinventing UAS powertrain. There's hybrid systems that are out there. So these are essentially an electric drone with a gas generator strapped onto it. And that really does extend flight time. It doesn't do a whole lot for payload. So we looked at that and found, we started rethinking from first principles, what can we do to extend flight time and payload? And in the automotive industry, what's been done is what's called a parallel hybrid, where the engine drives the wheels and an electric motor at the same time, and the motor can act as a generator or a motor. And we said, let's look at a parallel hybrid multi-rotor. And so we we hashed all that out. The numbers were looking good. We built the proof of concept and uh, did a whole lot of testing on it, and we're really happy with the results. And so this is our next iteration. It's really an alpha level product that we're developing right now. And it has the specs that that you see, but the audience can't see. So yeah, I'm just looking at the flyer again. And let me just try to describe this. So this is, okay, it's a quadcopter. I'm going to ask you to like, kind of like interject. So it has two, okay. (laughs) How do I describe (laughs) it? See, this is is why it's so cool is because there's not a lot of, of stuff that exists like this. So first what I'm looking at is like, it looks like a, nor- imagine a normal quadcopter. It's got big wooden props on it, but the engines that these props are attached to on each of the four arms have these two nice big red nacelles. Think of like a business jet with like two sleek red engines on the back, like kind of cylindrical, but these are flipped over. They're kind of vertically oriented. Tell us about what those things are. I mean, this is a, a hybrid electric system. This is a hybrid electric motor. Each motor on this right, right, has right. those red nacelles on it. Exactly. So each arm, each motor has these red nacelles. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best. I'm sorry, guys. What is this? <laughs> what you're looking at is what we call our hybrid power module. Okay. And it's a, a very tight integration between an internal combustion engine and an electric motor and an interesting clutch mechanism and other things like that, all packaged into this neat package and a cooling system and everything. And all of that goes on each corner of the drone. As opposed to having like a central generator that you were saying. So this design is radically different than pretty much anything that exists. Yeah, it's totally new. And it's also, it has a lot of benefits that kind of fall out naturally from the design, one of which is it's redundant. So that if one of those internal combustion engines has a failure, it can instantly clutch over to all electric propulsion on that prop. And then the other hybrid Mm. modules are providing power to that prop. So you have this level of redundancy where in many cases you can finish the mission and come back, or you can just decide to land, but it, you know, it's not just going to fall out of the sky. You can continue flying for a long yeah. time, even with a, an engine failure. That's extremely unique. There are very few, if any, I, I can't even name another kind of hybrid drone that I am very much aware of, like, like I am you guys, but just having that redundancy. And it's not just the whole system. It's each separate engine or motor that's on this drone. So that's super unique. Tell us about the prop. So what I was, I was, I was biting off more than I could chew and I was trying to describe everything. So we'll go slower now. So at the top, I mentioned a very large prop. It looks like the wooden prop at the top is 36 inches. First of all, two questions. Why wood? Second question is at the bottom. So at the inverse, so at the bottom, I forget the technical term for this. Help me out here with two props on it. Counter rotating Counter propellers. Yeah, of course. So the bottom prop on the, on the bottom face like the opposite direction yeah. towards the ground is plastic and it's a lot smaller diameter. So right. what's going on here? Why is there a wood one, a plastic one, and also what's up with this design? Why is one bigger? Why is one smaller? <laughs> Maybe t- <laughs> tell us a little bit going on here. Yeah, th- these are great questions. So <laughs> wood... Very intelligently uh, asked <laughs> questions too, by the way. So the wood is there because for our alpha design, it's just simply lower cost And also another benefit to wood is that it really absorbs a lot of the cyclical torque that's produced from the gas engine. So carbon props, when they fail, it's very catastrophic. 
And so rather than doing tons and tons of testing with carbon props that maybe weren't designed to run with a gas engine, we're just going with wood because it's kind of real quick and we, and we know it's going to work. But we're not tied to uh, wood as a final product. Because like, you guys Carbon's are still lighter. in the alpha stage yeah. running pilot programs. Exactly. And stuff. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, the great. that's actually, see, I love this. We have a CEO who's extraordinarily technical. This is amazing to, to hear. You can answer all the questions. So tell us then about the counter-rotating smaller plastic or carbon or it looks, yeah, what is it? So that, <laughs> that this is part of our IP that we're developing for our product. And it really, all of this is done to increase the range and duration capability of the aircraft. So those smaller props are all responsible for the stability control of the aircraft, while the big props on top are just providing the bulk thrust. And so by splitting the bulk thrust with the stability control, you can leverage an efficiency gain. Gotcha. So those props are not like tied together no. mechanically. So they they can operate at different speeds. And, exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very nice. And I just love, I just have to mention, like I'm getting like this super retro, sexy aviation vibe, like from old like airplane concept designs uh, with this red nacelles and the wooden props. I mean, it's really cool. And it's just such a nice juxtaposition with like the super modern. It looks like it's a carbon fiber, like fuselage basically yes, exactly. for the rest of the drone. Thank you. It's really cool. I mean, for for an alpha product, it's extremely polished and those engines are just something else to look at. So really cool. So let's yeah, go. Thank you. Yeah, Bob, thank you. Um, uh, let's go through some of the specs here. So this is crazy. Well, how much does this thing weigh? And how? just give us an idea of like how big is this aircraft right now? So engine to engine, or what we like to call our power module to power module, it's 1.7 meters or 5.6 feet okay. across. Gotcha. And it's configured as slightly an offset X. So we're not talking so, M- Matrice 200. We're not talking Phantom. We're talking Mavic. We're talking more of like human-sized kind of... <laughs> not that a human could sit in it, but, yeah. well, it could probably lift one, but a small one. Okay, so naturally it's a bigger aircraft. Right, it's a bigger aircraft, and the empty weight is 75 pounds. 75 pound aircraft. Okay. Right. So this does eclipse the 55 pound limit that the FAA has set for part 107 operators. That's correct. So what is up with that? How are you going to get around this? What's yeah, going on here? Uh, that's a great question. So <laughs> this aircraft is not for your everyday one o- part 107 pilot. It's for companies that can obtain COAs from the FAA to fly these heavier aircraft and also publicly operated aircraft It can also obtain these COAs to fly over 55 pounds. So this aircraft is really being designed for things like firefighting, disaster relief, search and rescue, and other applications like that. And then there are private companies that are working towards being able to operate or or even can operate over 55 pounds right now for things like ship to shore and remote unmanned logistics and things like that. That being said... We are planning on scaling this technology down to a lower than 55-pound aircraft. A little bit counterintuitive is that when you try to scale something like this down, everything becomes a fight for mass. And so the engineering becomes more complex because you have to do finite element analysis on every single part. And it takes a lot longer to take mass out of the system. Whereas for building this alpha product, it's easier to just say, okay, look, we know that w- these parts are going to hold up. We don't have to go crazy. At this size. Like yeah, it's easier exactly. to just kind of to push out. I mean, that makes total sense. And the strategy you guys are taking too, you were just mentioning, hey, yeah, we've got pilot programs. We're running them. We've got interested parties. So that's right. awesome. So some of these other specs, this is crazy. The dry weight, the dry mass is 75 pounds. I'm, I'm not going to use the metric system okay. just so our U.S. listeners can appreciate this as well. Sorry to anyone that's more used to metric. So 75 pounds dry mass, maximum takeoff weight is 165 pounds. So that means that you can carry a 90-pound payload potentially on this thing? Right. So the the maximum takeoff weight includes the payload and fuel. So if you want to just talk about the payload specs... 75 pounds. 75 pounds max payload with a hover time of an hour, 50 pounds payload, a hover time of 2.7 hours. And then a 10-pound payload, which is that 6.4-hour figure, which is just crazy. What weighs 10 pounds? 
a lidar system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like six. <laughs> who raise your hand? I'm sure there's people that are just going to freak out over this. Like we're actually looking at something. This is something that's. I don't want to say it's rare, but in drones right now, this is one of the coolest things. I mean, it's true en- engineering innovation with just this engine design, the hybrid powertrain. It's really cool. I mean, it reminds me of Impossible Aerospace, but it's fundamentally completely different because they are using only electric power to power like a two-hour flight time or something. Don't quote me on that. I don't know. Anyways, it's really, really interesting. So let's go to then... So we talked a lot about the hardware, what makes this unique, because I want to get into more of just like how, I think this is just fantastically interesting. Let's talk a little bit more about, I guess you can call it the software, the firmware, just like the mainframe flight controller. You guys, I'm imagining, had to develop this yourselves or had to get really nitty gritty with the nuts and bolts to power, like, so with all electric drones, UAVs, unmanned aircraft, you've got a flight controller and it interfaces with electronic speed controllers. Are you guys using a similar method? Like since you have mechanical kind of like combustion engine components, does it have to be something totally unique? Like just tell us what's happening on the software side of things with this on board the aircraft. Yeah, that you're pointing to the crux of the design challenges with this aircraft. And we've developed a interface board. Right now we're interfacing with the PixHawk controller. So the PixHawk essentially gives our board the flight commands. And then our board has its own microcontroller. And then it figures out what to do with Hmm. all the gas engines, all the electric motors, and everything else that's on board the aircraft. There's a lot that goes into yeah. actually calculating what each thing should be doing to make it fly properly. That's crazy. So right now then I'm imagining, since this is still kind of the alpha product, how is the flight accomplished? Is it through, I'm imagining that you guys haven't done a ton of software development yet to create your own apps or anything. Not to, yet. Yeah, but I met, is that on the roadmap then to get to a really nice place with software as well to really customize? Absolutely. And we're really taking a powertrain first approach because that's really what's new here. And then we can use a lot of off-the-shelf flight planning software and things like that to actually do our pilot programs with. As that becomes more sophisticated, we will develop our own software and or partner with people that have good solutions that are already available. Great approach. Keeps you guys a lot more focused, I'm sure. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Genius New York invests millions of dollars in drone and tech startups each year and is looking for its next million dollar team. The Business Accelerator located in Syracuse, New York provides your startup with resources, mentors, and industry leading connections, plus a chance to compete for $1 million. So if you have a startup focused on unmanned systems, IoT, automation, or data analytics, don't miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. Apply today at GeniusNY.com. What could your startup do with a million bucks? Go to GeniusNY.com and apply today. Step into the growing season with this very special treat from MicaSense. For this month only, that's July 2019, buy a MicaSense Altum sensor and get a six-month Agisoft MetaShape license included for free and enjoy high-quality thermal and multispectral imagery, with advanced analytics. So the Altum sensor integrates a radiometric thermal camera with five high-resolution narrow bands, producing advanced thermal, multispectral, and high-resolution imagery in just one flight for advanced analytics in agriculture. So during July, get your MicaSense Altum sensor with a free six-month license of Agisoft Metashape by using code AGI2019 at micasense.com. Okay, back to the show. Then moving on a little bit, we briefly talked about some of the industries or some of the use cases for this, but you've said you've been just like hitting the pavement hard, you know, talking to tons of people who are finding, maybe you can share some of the cool use cases that others would be using a platform, a heavy lift, high endurance platform like this for. Yeah, there's there's a lot of use cases and some of them are great above that 55 pound limit, others are going to be really good below it. Like I say, the technology can really scale in both directions pretty well. So one use case, for example, is LIDAR and doing larger maps where they just want more endurance. And one of the pain points is that 
even with the hybrid drones that are out there, is if you have an engine failure, you only have like two minutes to land. And sometimes it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. And so some of the people in that industry are saying, look, this would be great because it can continue flying if there's a failure. It's really that fail-safe mechanism that's a big selling point for LiDAR. I mean, LiDAR units of that size are incredibly expensive as well. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And then other use cases are heavier optics for longer range zoom. Like if you want to do infrared zoom at a long range, some of those optical pods are pretty big. And I I was wondering like, well, can't you just shrink that? And then the answer I got is that you can't (laughs) shrink optics. Optics are, yeah, very tough. I was just talking to FLIR and um, they were telling me, well, they have another crazy engineering uh, crew that are behind that. But yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's that one's like, it's like physics. Like it's, you physics. Can't. <laughs> it's physics. It's yeah. physics. I mean, and, and there's always workarounds, always, you know, physics is interesting. But yeah. uh, basically, so that's another use case is having these larger optical sensors that just are heavy. And for public safety, you want to put that up in the air for a long time. And this is a way to do it. And then you get into things like gas sensing and stuff like that. That's another very heavy. Like methane. Yeah, there's these gas sensors that actually capture gas, and they're pretty heavy. And so I was just talking with some of those guys today, and they're like, yeah, we, like the mission time. We're really constrained right now. We're really constrained by the flight time. So they're, they're very interested as well. And those are all those 50, under 55-pound applications. When you start getting heavier, it's carrying these big cameras for cinematography. Uh, some of those packages are quite heavy, weighing almost 50 pounds themselves. And then going up even further, then you really get into unmanned logistics for firefighting, disaster relief, search and rescue, ship-to-shore applications. There's a ton of different things in in those kind of markets. Yeah. I mean, it just makes the mind uh, start working because at one point, I remember like early on in drones, you know, we've all heard of agriculture, construction, everything right now. That's just like sticking a small camera. What can you do with it? Right. Photogrammetry, do it, blah, blah, blah. Now we're talking about moving stuff around, heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. Stuff that really we didn't seem, it didn't seem feasible or possible when all of everyone was just really looking at the form factor of a DJI Phantom or similar, which is still happening today. I mean, right. everything's still about a lot about photogrammetry and stuff. Obviously, you can stick bigger cameras on here, so that's super interesting. One spec I don't see on here, and it's not that important, but like, what kind of speed can this thing fly at? It's interesting because like the specs are more about like, hey, this is the engines, the motors, uh, what have you, and you know, it's all the power uh, statistics here and the metrics on that. But is this thing like super fast too? It's going to be hella fast. <laughs> good answer. Spoken <laughs> like a true person who lives in California. Yeah. Hella fast. Yeah. That's good. That's all. You know what? You should put that spec on there. <laughs> you don't need to put anything else. It's yeah. going to be hella fast. <laughs> well, the, there are some platforms that are roughly this size that are on the market and they are around 50 miles per hour in forward flight. The thing is, we're going to have some really, really crazy peak powers. Our continuous power is uh, 19 kilowatts or 25 horsepower. 25 horsepower. Yeah, but that's the continuous power. The actual uh. peak power is going to be something closer to like 35. So it's going to have a lot of dynamic capability to really do some quick maneuvers and get out of tough situations. And that means flying in high winds. It's one of the big problems with fire is that the manned aircraft often just can't fly because it's too windy. And so they're grounded. And so this, we're hoping will be able to fill some of those gaps when it's just too windy to fly. A lot more wind resistance, yeah. That's really cool. So one thing I want to say is, of course, there's also one thing you didn't really mention yet, specifically was like delivery, so drone delivery. I mean, this thing is primed to carry some nice big packages. And I actually think this might even be better for, and you already touched on this, was like ship to shore applications or even like, oil rigs and things that need stuff like really, really, not just fast, but like urgently. Like yes. it could be someone that's living on this rig that like needs something life-saving. And then this kind of, this puppy could go out there. I mean, the the range on it will be very, very far too, which brings up, of course, beyond visual line of sight stuff. But it, you got to get a waiver at a COA anyways yeah. uh, for something like that. So we're not even going to dive into that. But that kind of stuff is super, super interesting. And so this thing could have also a very, very far range yeah. um, with potentially, you know, six hours one way. So that's really cool. 
Uh, UAM, so urban air mobility, another thing we chatted about earlier. So carrying the most precious cargo of all human beings. So you said you had some interesting thoughts. I don't know them yet. Um, We touched on this, uh, but the hybridization. So I will just lead off with this Bell helicopter. Bell, I did an episode on eVTOL aircraft, UAM stuff. They released something called the Nexus. It's here at Exponential. Uh, It's a hybrid It is a hybrid aircraft. It's a big one where passengers will go into. It's optionally piloted, and it has a hybrid electric propulsion system. Thoughts on that? Tell me what you were thinking, because I I didn't get it yet. (laughs) Sure. So it makes sense to me why they are hybridizing, because they're trying to have it do missions with a longer useful range, not just the, you know, Uber Air point A to point B when it's just maybe you know, 20 or 30 miles or something like that. They're trying to really get some range in there. And especially that's important for a lot of applications such as air ambulances, where you're really doing an air ambulance in an urban setting. So when we think of an air ambulance right now, you're talking about a helicopter. Helicopters can't land anywhere. Yeah, There's more places that a UAM air ambulance can land. But interestingly, there was a big NASA study that was NASA hired a contractor to do this study, and they they looked at the air ambulance situation, and they said, you know, air ambulance is the one application where being all electric probably won't work, Hmm. where that really needs to be hybrid because you think about it, the air ambulance lands back at the hospital, it might have to turn and burn Mm. and go pick somebody else up. It can't sit there and recharge. Gotcha. And also, it might need to go further it might need a further range. So the study really pointed out that air ambulances is one application where hybridization is really important. That being said, personally, the future of transportation really does need to be all electric slash carbon neutral. And I'm a former Tesla guy. Yeah, so it's, it's in my say, right? it's in my blood. And like you've been working on the future of transportation even before this, right? Exactly. And so, like to me, like why am I doing hybrid? Well, I'm doing it because. If we're putting a forest fire out, that's great. You know, that's really good for the environment. This is really core to me as a person and to my company is that we are doing right by the environment. So I believe in the future, the battery technology will get there where all these applications can really truly be all electric. Transportation definitely needs to be all electric. On our technology roadmap is to start using renewable fuels for a lot of applications. So if we're doing package delivery, I'm going to insist that those are carbon neutral applications. And there are good carbon neutral fuels that are out there that are compatible with some of the engine technology that's also available. So that's something that I'm looking forward to. Right now, we're not developing around that because it's it's expensive to start with, but it's definitely in our DNA and on our roadmap. That's a really good point, and it's cool to understand like your thought process on this as you guys grow, looking to the future to be more and more carbon neutral, of course. <sighs> Coming from Tesla and designing, I mean, you've been looking at that. You're a total battery powertrain nerd. Like, it's, yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, and it's freaking cool because like, it's fun to nerd out about this stuff. So right now, and I was asking you earlier, so one of the challenges I see in with this is like right now everyone is so primed and when I say everyone I just mean the drone industry as a whole and companies that are looking to use drones in their business they're so primed that you just plug it in you charge the battery you stick it in whatever first thing you said almost when you came on here is that look you are severely limited when you're carrying payloads for that we're not saying that the Phantom or whatever or the Mavic with the camera that's like a lot of people don't need you know, two hour, an hour, two hours, four hours, six hours from that. Right. But with this, what I saw was one of the challenges is that, okay, you're fundamentally, you, it just takes a little bit different way of thinking about it. Cause now we're talking about a bigger drone. We're talking about more payload capability, greater endurance, more range. But the only kicker is that you actually need to have another fuel, so like a liquid fuel basically right now. And I, so I said, are you going to be able to use, I asked you before we started recording, are you going to be able to use like 87 octane uh, fuel basically from the gas station? And you said yes. Yeah, the, so that's right. Right now we are using gasoline. And this is actually a good thing for a lot of applications. The reason is this, that for example, with firefighting, the firefighters already have two-stroke oil mixed with their gasoline, ready to go for their chainsaws. They have gasoline for their ATVs. So 
having that capability is useful so they don't have to carry two different sources of fuel. Yeah. For them, it's not like a huge inconvenience or anything like that. It's just, yeah. the, it's a convenience. And the problem with, with having heavy lift electric drones in the field is that you have to then have a generator that's doing all your charging and it's more equipment that you have to have on site. For other applications, for the military, they really like heavy fuel, kerosene, essentially, jet fuel, because that's what they want everything to run off of one type of fuel so they don't have to have mm-hmm. all these different types of fuel. And then, like I said, for eventually we want to do carbon neutral fuels for logistics applications. So we're talking like um, canola oil or something like that or some type of like bio fuel? Yeah, and there's companies that are out there that already make carbon neutral fuels or that are to a very large percentage completely renewable. Like I run, I have a diesel Passat and I run that car off of a product called HPR, which I get at a pump. Mm. It's roughly the same price as diesel, but it's like 90% renewable or something like oh, that. Nice. So there's definitely products out there that can be used. And another thing that's actually just caught my eye looking at the flyer with the specs again is that the battery on board is only 60. And I know actually if the true battery nerds in the room will probably say that this isn't the most, I guess, effective way of looking at a battery's like power capacity or whatever. But in drones, usually the milliamp hours or the amp hours, what you look at usually equates to how long the drone can kind of fly in the air. So if you like pump that up in layman's terms, then it's going to be able to fly for longer The battery that you guys have on this thing that can fly for 6.4 hours with a 10-pound payload is only 6.2 amp hours or 6,200 milliamp hours. That's like the size of what? Like a standard phantom battery almost? Yeah, pretty close. That's crazy. So like it's so efficient then that... Like how much fuel does this thing burn then or what? So the the battery is really there to act as a, a buffer and a redundant source of power. It's primarily, this is a fuel-powered aircraft mm. that uses a hybrid system to optimize the fuel efficiency and to provide redundancy. So it's not a plug-in hybrid. It's not like you want to go home and plug it in, recharge it, and refuel it. No, no. You, the battery is there to act as a buffer. So if the battery wasn't there, what would happen? We would have to have like super capacitors or something to like to make our DC bus clean. You definitely need the the battery in the loop there. Super capacitors to make the DC bus clean. Okay, <laughs> I'll take I'll take your word for that one. Um, oh God. Okay, so we kind of talked about this too. I'm having so much fun with this conversation because it's like it's so cool to me, if you couldn't tell already, but what is the future of parallel flight technologies? What do we have to look forward? You gave us a little bit of a glimpse at your roadmap and your philosophy before, but maybe you could give us like a little bit more, like where do you guys want to be in five, 10 years, something like that? Like, what can you imagine? So the immediate future is doing pilot programs with interested parties who have heavy lift applications. So we're lining a bunch of those up. We're excited about them. And I think they'll all be great demonstrations of the technology. I think there's going to be a lot of learning on both sides. On our side, learning the requirements of the customer. And on the customer side, really thinking, oh, wow, you mean we could do this? For example, I was at a conference the other day, and I spoke about what we were building. And immediately after the conference, this guy came up to me and he said, look, I do mosquito control. Right now, I have to swap batteries and payload every 10 minutes. And that's still cheaper than their other solutions. But he was saying, if we could just fly that whole mission, that would be great. Subsequently, we're in conversation and looking at, you know, how can we do a pilot program around mosquito control? And of course, we have to partner with somebody who has developed the software for mosquito control, right? So it's it's really, we can provide the airframe and the powertrain system, and then somebody else can provide the software for the application. And we really come together uh, in a partnership to demonstrate the technology. So a platform approach. Right. So that's, that's just one example. We definitely see ourselves producing these platforms for a lot of different applications. We really, really want to get this into the hands of firefighting because I think it's going to save lives, property, and the environment. And from there, really, the sky's the limit. I believe the future of industries like firefighting will be unmanned because they're extremely dangerous, It's limited to daylight hours right now. So in the future, it's easy to conceive of all of that happening unmanned. So it's safer. It's happening at nighttime when the fire is more vulnerable. And 
we're looking at it potentially a 10x reduction in cost on stopping this kind of environmental crisis. So, and it's a worldwide problem. And so really mm-hmm. I see that is the vision, the big vision for the company. There's a lot of different applications out there and I'm sure we're going to be surprised as things evolve. We're even talking with large uh, helicopter companies who also recognize that unmanned systems are the future of their industry and they want to get ahead of that curve. And so they're talking with us and saying, what can we do to do some pilot programs around things like search and rescue and ship to shore and stuff like that? Well, I will be watching you guys like a hawk <laughs> um, and um, just totally fascinated. Absolutely love what you guys are doing, what you've done, and just the passion and the gusto that you've come at this uh, with such a clear mission in mind. So Joshua Resnick, CEO of Parallel Flight Technologies, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It was an absolute pleasure. If you're listening and you want to learn more and you want to actually see a picture of this thing, um, head to their website. It's parallelflight.com. Check out um, what they got cooking up here. That's all I've got. I'm just, I'm just kind of blown away. So yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me me on the show and uh it's great to be here live because like i said i'm a huge fan of the show so (laughs) all right your check is in the mail awesome thank thank you you. (laughs) all right guys we're gonna cut off the mics cheers